The Cuban Revolutionary Conference is over, where extensive plans were laid for the overthrow of the United States government as well as many Latin American governments. Castro hopes to have the red flag over Washington by 1972, just four and one half years from now. It is strange that the American government should be bogged down in a major war 10,000 miles from home where hundreds of Americans are dying each month and be so unconcerned about a far more dangerous situation just 90 miles off the coast of the United States. A few days ago, a leading American clergyman said that violence was necessary to end social injustice. I could not help wondering where the Lord Jesus Christ was in all of this. With our television screens filled with pictures of rioting, looting, killing, and violence in various cities, we now have the spectacle of an American clergyman calling for more violence in order to achieve social ends. It seems that some church leaders are willing to go even further than the humanist and the secularist, first in announcing a few years ago the death of God, and now calling for violence. How different from the attitude of Christ, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. How different from the admonitions of the Apostle Paul who wrote, let us have no imitation Christian love. Let us have a genuine break with evil and a real devotion to good. Let us have real warm affection, he said, for one another as between brothers, and a willingness to let the other man have the credit. When trials come, endure them patiently. Steadfastly maintain the habit of prayer. And as for those who try to make your life a misery, bless them. Don't curse, bless. Live in harmony with each other, said Paul. Don't pay back a bad turn for a bad turn. As far as your responsibility goes, live at peace with everyone. Never take vengeance into your own hands, my dear friends, he said. Stand back and let God punish as he will. The Apostle Paul continues, and I'm quoting from the Phillips translation in Romans 12. Don't allow yourselves to be overpowered by evil. Take the offensive. Overpower evil with good. Every Christian, he wrote, ought to obey the civil authorities, for all legitimate authority is derived from God's authority, and the existing authority is appointed under God. To oppose authority, then, said Paul, is to oppose God, and such opposition is bound to be punished. Certainly the church is to be concerned about the social injustices in our world. Even a casual study of the life of Jesus reveals that he was interested in man's response to the social problems he faced. Since Jesus Christ walked the earth, the thinking of the world concerning social matters has changed radically. Because of him, the world has witnessed a new reverence for human life and learned something of the dignity and worth of man. Three out of every five men whom Paul passed on the streets of Rome were slaves. It was Christ's assertion that every individual has great value in the sight of God. And it was this message that helped eventually to free the slaves. He said, of how much more value is a man than a sheep? It was Jesus who taught us that every man is a potential child of God. When he lived on earth, no one was his special pet because of riches or poverty. Rank and social distinction meant nothing to him. It was for man as man that Christ cared. And because of Jesus, woman has been lifted to her present position. In much of ancient literature, women were regarded as little more than animals. I've never understood how any woman could reject Jesus Christ when Christ has done so much for womanhood. As a result of the coming of Christ, thousands of Christians through the ages have given their lives to help their neighbor, to relieve poverty, to care for the sick. Most hospitals, orphanages, institutions for the poor and asylums have had their origin in Him. The social conscience of man was deepened by the coming of Christ. Why then is the world in such a desperate plight, you ask? The answer is, because it will not come to Jesus Christ that it might have life, according to John 5.40. The world has rejected Him. To be sure, part of its conscience still considers Jesus' teaching, but its conduct doesn't reflect His wisdom. Christ can save the world only, as He is living in the hearts of men and women. We talk glibly about the establishment of the Christian order of society through legislation and social engineering, and even now by violence, as though we could bring it down from the skies if we only worked and fought hard enough. The kingdom of God will never come that way. If the human race should suddenly turn to Christ, 
we would have immediately the possibility of a new Christian order. We could approach our problems in the framework of Christian understanding and brotherhood. To be sure, problems would remain, but the atmosphere for their solution would be completely changed. I have an intense affinity with those who are working in the inner city churches. It is probably the most frustrating ministry of today to face teeming areas of people of different ethnic groups living in substandard housing, thousands of them unemployed. Religious ideas have little meaning for many of them. Their lives are disorganized. The inner city pastor faces all their frustrations and tries with compassion to enter into their problems. But if we're going to touch the inner city life of our communities, we must know their sorrows, their trials, their temptations, and we must stand with them in their heartbreaks. Jesus Christ entered into the arena of our troubles, and he wept with them that wept and rejoiced with them that rejoiced. Any man who cares enough to want to bless the lives of people must somehow sit where they sat. However, having said that, we must remember that they are still people. And as people, they are sinners and in need of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. We must not make the mistake of blaming all their troubles on an impersonal society that we think has done them a terrible injustice. In many cases it has. But this is not the total problem. It's true that terrible social injustices need to be righted. But this is not the whole problem. The basic problem was pointed out by Jesus when he said, Far from within, out of the heart of man, come all the evils of mankind. He said all these evil things come from within, and they defile a man. Jesus said that in Mark 7, 21 through 23. Read it for yourself. Jesus indicated that our problem is heart trouble. The greatest need of our great cities at this moment is evangelism. The Apostle Paul stood in the heart of pagan, secular, immoral, and violent Corinth and said, We preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. The proclamation of the gospel is still the desperate need of men today. We're never going to reverse the moral trends without a spiritual awakening. And we're never going to have a spiritual awakening until the cross of Christ is central in all of our teaching and preaching in the church. David Brainerd, in his journal of his life and doings among the American Indians, said, I never got away from Jesus and him crucified. And I found that when my people were gripped by this great evangelical doctrine of Christ and him crucified, I had no need to give them instructions about morality. I found that one followed as sure and inevitable fruit of the other. Dorothy Sayers says, We've been trying for several centuries to uphold a particular standard of ethical values which derives from Christian dogma, while gradually dispensing with the very dogma which is the sole foundation for those values. If we want Christian behavior, then we must realize that Christian behavior is rooted in Christian belief. James Stewart, professor at New College in Edinburgh, says the driving force of the early Christian mission was not propaganda of beautiful ideals of the brotherhood of man. It was proclamation of the mighty acts of God. At the very heart of the apostles' message stood the divine redemptive deed on Calvary. Ladies and gentlemen, if the church wants high moral standards in the nation and a new social justice, then let the church get back to preaching the simple authoritative gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit that will transform men. It was this gospel that brought about many of the great social reforms of the past. The preaching of the cross and the resurrection have been primarily responsible for promoting humanitarian sentiment and social concern during the last 400 years. Prison reform, the prohibition of the slave trade, the abolition of slavery, improvement in working conditions, the protection of children, the crusade against cruelty to animals, are the outcome of the great religious awakenings brought about by the proclamation of the gospel. Dr. Folks Jackson, the distinguished church historian, says, History shows that the thought of Christ on the cross has been more potent than anything else in arousing a compassion for suffering and the indignation at injustice. We must realize that while the law should guarantee human rights and restrain those who violate those rights, 
Whenever men lack sympathy for the law, they will not long respect it, even when they cannot repeal it. Thus the government may try to legislate Christian behavior, but it soon finds that man remains unchanged. The changing of men is the primary mission of the church. The only way to change men is to get them converted to Jesus Christ. Then they will have the capacity to live up to the Christian command to love thy neighbor. There's no doubt that today we see social injustice everywhere. However, looking on our American scene, Jesus would see something even deeper. If only we could begin at the root of our problems, which is the disease of human nature that the Bible calls sin. This is why Christ came and died on the cross. This is why he shed his blood to do something about this disease that mankind is suffering from. We in the church today are in danger of becoming blundering social physicians, giving medicine here and putting ointment there on the sores of the world. But the great need is for the church to call in the great physician who alone can properly diagnose the case. He will look beneath the mere skin eruptions and pronounce the cause of it all, sin, and he will do something about it. If we in the church want a cause to fight, let's fight sin. Let's reveal its hideousness. Let's show that Jeremiah was correct when he said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Then when the center of man's trouble is dealt with, when this disease is eradicated, when we point men to the cure which is Christ and Him crucified, and when men receive Him, then and only then will man live with man as brother with brother. I believe in taking a stand on moral, social, and spiritual issues of our day. I've used this radio program, The Hour of Decision, for years to preach on every social issue I can think of. I've talked on everything from bad housing to highway safety. However, the social issues of our day have not been the main theme of my preaching. My main theme has been the same as that of the early apostles, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. In Europe, several countries have what is called the welfare state. It's true that many social problems of these countries have been solved. However, church leaders are beginning to realize that man cannot live by bread alone. They are beginning to realize that man has deeper spiritual needs to which only Christ can minister. That is the reason why a million people came to the Earl's Court in London for nine nights and to 25 other auditoriums throughout Britain to hear the gospel and why over 38,000 of them responded to the appeal to receive Christ as Lord and Savior a few weeks ago. You today need the same Christ. Many of you have social security. Many of you can be termed wealthy. But you too have found that man cannot live by bread alone. Miss Stalin, who came to this country, said, I found in the Soviet Union that I could not live in a world without God. And yet many of you that are listening to my voice are trying to live in a world without God. But you too are finding the emptiness, the boredom, the frustration of it all. You need Christ to help meet the inner needs of your life, the boredom, the lack of satisfaction, the lack of purpose in your life. You need Christ to give you a purpose. You need Christ to give that new dimension, which is called eternal life. Will you receive Him today as your Lord and your Savior? Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we pray that Christ will come into the hearts and lives of many that are listening to our voice today throughout the world, that He will transform them from the inside out, and that we will go back into society to be a witness for Him. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me, and I hope you brought your Bibles. I suggested last night that you bring your Bibles every night to the 16th chapter of the book of Acts. The Apostle Paul and his friend Silas had come to Philippi. And when they got to Troy, or when they got to Philippi, which was a Roman colony and a very important city, they went out to the riverside and they found some Jewish women praying. Maybe there were some Greeks there too, I don't know, but I think they were largely Jewish. And they were praying. They believed in God. They had never heard probably of Jesus Christ, but they believed in God and they believed in prayer. And God was honoring them. 
And so Paul and Silas went to that prayer group and began to pray with them and then began to tell them about all the things that had happened in Jerusalem with the death of Christ and how he rose from the dead. And Paul and Silas were there with them. And while they were there, there was a woman possessed of a demon that came out screaming every day and making life miserable for them. And one day Paul was fed up. Yes, a Christian can get fed up. And he got fed up. And he turned to the woman and he said to the demon, come out of that woman. And the demon left the woman. And the men that had been making money on her prophesying, which was coming from the devil, became angry because they were making a big profit on this woman. And so they had Paul and Silas thrown in jail. And when they put them in jail, they told the jailer to put these dangerous men in the inner cells, lock their feet in chains to great big steel blocks. And they did. And while they were in the prison, they began to sing. And they began to preach. They were being tortured. But that just made them happy all the time, that they had the privilege of suffering for God. And they began to sing and rejoice. And the other prisoners heard them. And the jailer heard them. And about midnight, an earthquake came. And that earthquake shook loose the foundations of that prison and the doors were opened and the chains fell off and they were free and the other prisoners were free and the jailer knew that he would be held responsible with his life so he drew out his sword and was going to kill himself because he knew the Roman authorities would do that to him and Paul said don't do yourself any harm we're still here so the jailer looked at them and thought about what they'd been preaching and singing about and he fell down in front of them and asked a question that the whole world today is asking he said what must I do to be saved what must I do to be saved and all over the world tonight people are asking that question it's the cry of the whole world H.G. Wells said Many years ago, there's only one question left for the human race to ask, and that is, what must I do to be saved? A boy, when we were in New York, was trapped in a well, and the only message they got from him was, save me. Men were trapped in a mine some time ago in Kentucky, and they sent a message out, said, please save us. Earlier this year in San Francisco, Nina Davis was saved outside her burning home. But her three children between the ages of three and ten were inside, screaming, save us from the fire, save us from the fire, the place had caught fire. Their mother raced through the flames, threw them out one by one to safety. But she was burned to death. That was what Jesus Christ did. The place was on fire. We were lost. And Jesus came on the cross and suffered and died for you so you can be saved. He took the sins that you committed, all the things that stood between you and God and was going to send you to judgment and destruction and hell, Jesus took on him. It cost him his life on the cross so that you, one by one, crying, save me, save me, might be saved. And people are crying for different things. They're crying, save us from war. Jesus said, ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars till the end of time. There are Armageddon books and films being made today. World leaders are desperately searching for means of saving the human race. And then there are people that are saying, save us from terrorism and lawlessness. But you know, the Bible says that the whole world has transgressed the laws of God. And that word transgression could be translated lawlessness or terrorism. Many city streets throughout the world have been turned into jungles of terror. Mugging, carjacking, drive-by shootings, rape and death. Then there's a cry to save our homes. One out of every two marriages in America now breaks up. 
Children are out of control. One of our problems, of course, is television. Television itself is fine. It's what we do with it and what we put over it. It's people that are doing it. And all the violence and all the sex and all the talk shows that seem to just feed on that sort of thing. And America's morals are now being set, not by the Bible, not by our conscience, but by what comes over that tube, especially those afternoon talk shows. Last week, a former professional baseball player, Dave Dravesky, spoke at a community leader's prayer breakfast here in Sacramento. And the Sacramento Bee quoted him as saying, it's wonderful to pray for our leaders, and we must, but we've got to begin with the family. He said, that's where the fiber of this country is being ripped apart. And that's right. Our families must come together as families. And we must recognize the responsibility that each member of the family has. Because that's the basic unit of our society. Job said, my days are without hope. Isaiah said, even the youths shall faint and be weary. The psalmist said, and I said, oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then I would fly away and be at rest. The psalmist longing to escape has become the cry of the world. There seems to be no way out. And to those people, Jesus said, I am the way. I'm the way out. Jesus, Jesus said, by, I'm the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. So all of mankind is crying out, what must I do to be saved? And the apostle Paul gave that jailer in Philippi that night a very simple answer. And the gospel is very simple. The answer is very simple. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's all. Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's a story that all of you probably know. The man that wrote Amazing Grace, John Newton, he helped bring slaves to America from Africa. He was a slaver. And one night, his ship was caught in a terrible storm, and he didn't think they'd survive. And he fell down on his knees and cried out to the God he had learned about when he was a boy. And he remember, remembered a few verses his mother had taught him from the Bible. And he said those verses that he remembered. And he let Christ come into his heart. Yes, he was afraid. Do you think that was a genuine conversion? If you go to Matthew 23, you'll see what Jesus said about the religious leaders of his day. He called them every name you could think of. You wouldn't think Jesus would use language like that, but he did. Because they had created a modern God. And our modern God today has the attributes of love and mercy and forgiveness, but it's without judgment. How many of us hear messages on judgment and hell today? Not many. But it's all through the Bible. God is a God of judgment and he's going to judge the world someday and he's going to judge you and me someday even religious leaders try to reconstruct a god according to the secular and humanistic trends of our time the bible says evil men understand not judgment the answer that paul gave to this jailer long ago is so simple that millions stumble over it you don't have to straighten out your life first before you come to Christ. You say, Billy, I've done so many things I've got to straighten out. I owe things, debts that I ought to pay. How can I come the way I am? You come just as you are. Because just as I am before God, and I'm a sinner, I'll tell you, I have sinned. But I know that all of them are under the blood of Christ. That's why Christ went to the cross. And when you come to Christ, you don't have to go back and try to straighten out all those things. 
You don't have to make yourselves well before you go to a doctor. You go to a doctor because you're sick. Jesus was called a great physician. He said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I'm a sinner. And I need to repent of my sins. I need to turn from my sins. I need to tell God, oh God, I'm sorry I've sinned. And please forgive me and help me to change my way of living. He came to call you and he came to call me. And on the outside, people think you're good. But deep inside, you know that your heart is like everybody else. It's treacherous. It's rebellious. It's sinful. We need the forgiveness that only Christ can give from the cross. If we're ever to get to heaven, you can come to Christ tonight, just as you are. It's a great joy and privilege for my wife and me and two or three of my associates to be with you once again. It seems that we turn up about every summer. We've just come from the United States where we just concluded a crusade Sunday a week ago at uh, the Veterans Stadium in Philadelphia. We would appreciate your prayers for those that are doing follow-up in these crusades there. We've had the scripture text read to us, and I'm not going to read that over because it's rather long, but I'll just tell you a little about it and get a few thoughts that perhaps you can use or think about as we go along. The men that were meeting in Munich this past week, leaders, came away, some of them privately saying, the situation reminds them of the beginning of World War I because it was in Sarajevo and those Balkan states where the Duke, the Archduke was assassinated and where the war began. And we need to pray that God will continue to give us a period of peace because the gospel is going out to the world. And I think about uh, this ministry here, which became the first, or among the first, with HCJB in Ecuador, to reach the world for Christ by radio. And what a vision God gave to Paul Freed and those associated with him. Now, I want you to see these disciples with Jesus that we read about. They were in a storm. And if you've ever been on a storm in the Sea of Galilee, you'll know something about how vicious they can become. Some of the most vicious storms in the world are in the Sea of Galilee. And it's like a great hurricane and a tornado all mixed up with one. And here this storm had hit the sea. And Jesus was there in asleep in the boat and the disciples were in the boat and many other boats were alongside, it says. And they were all frightened. And they yelled to Jesus because he was asleep in the midst of the storm. How wonderful to have that ability to sleep in the midst of a storm. But then Jesus comes to the other side of the lake. And on the other side of the lake, there's a man. A wretched man. A terrible wreck of a man. That comes running down the hillside. He's bleeding. He'd been chained. He was demon-possessed. The people had tried to hold him and contain him, and they couldn't. And so he came running up to Jesus. And he said, Jesus, what do you have to do with us? And Jesus was very calm and very tender, as he always was, in dealing with people like this. And he dealt with this man. He had said to the storm, peace be still. And the disciples had wondered in amazement at how Jesus could calm that storm. But here was another storm, a storm that you and I meet every day on the streets, a storm that we see in the hearts and lives of people and families. Today, how many Christian families are being broken and torn that we hear about or we experience in our homes. And there are storms everywhere. And Jesus had quieted that storm. Now he comes to another storm and this storm is caused by the devil. It's caused by the demons. And he asked, what is your name? They said, our name is Legion, for we are many. 
and uh, a Roman legion had something like 3,000 to 6,000 people in it. So here were hundreds of demons in this man. Mary Magdalene, you remember, had seven. And I'm sure that many of the problems that we deal with in mental institutions today are not physical or psychiatric. They are demons. I've been in some of these places where I could only explain what I saw by demon power. And these can only be handled by a great deal of prayer. And Jesus said on certain occasions, prayer and fasting. And we've had to pray and fast many times as we have encountered these type of people in our travels and going from place to place. We were in a place in Camden, New Jersey the other day and it was a place made up of people that all had been on drugs. And drugs, I think, is being used by demons today, especially in America, to destroy us. It's, a, it's, it's unbelievable. And AIDS and drugs go hand in hand. And something is happening, not only in our country, but throughout the world. And they say that AIDS will destroy a great part of Africa in the next few years unless we find the cure. The cure is Christ. Because it's a spiritual problem we're dealing with. The demons of sex perversion, the demons of disease like that can only be dealt with supernaturally. There were three prayers prayed that day. Only one was answered. The one that was answered was prayed by the demons. The demons said, please, if you cast us out, send us to that herd of swine up there, 2,000 of them, hogs feeding up there. And there's a great illustration. They were going to go to hell. Jesus was going to send them to hell. But they, they said, we'd rather be in those swine. And that shows us something of how horrible the future is without Christ. Whatever you think about hell, it's a terrible time of separation from God. And these demons did not want that experience. They didn't want to spend eternity away from God. And then the second prayer that was prayed was the prayer that the people from the city came out and saw that their hogs were jumping over the cliff, 2,000 of them. That was their living. That was their income. And their industry was being destroyed. And they were far more interested in their materialism than they were in spiritual things. Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? And they were making that choice. And they, they said, Jesus, leave us alone. Leave this area. And you know what? Jesus answered their prayer. He left their area. He never came back as far as we know in Scripture. He never came to that area again. They had a chance to have their whole community revived and changed and transformed in every way, but they turned it down. They said, Jesus, we don't need you because, you see, you, you come between us and our pleasures. We have to give up certain things if we follow you. And we can't do that. And so they prayed. And their prayers were answered. And that's the prayer of some of us. And we can say that unconsciously. Lord, you're speaking to me about a certain thing. Please leave me alone. I don't want to be disturbed. There's a secret sin in your life. Something that you wouldn't want others to know. But someday it's all going to be known. And there's going to come a time when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord of Lords. And you are going to have to deal with Jesus whether you like it or not. Because that day is coming. And it's coming more quickly for some of us than for some of you. 
but it's coming and time is very short and the older I get the more I begin to realize how quickly time flies I read in the papers last week that they sent me from home that they had announced that I had a disease and uh, there was some speculation in the press as to how quickly I would be gone from this earth some of it sounded very excited they were very happy to see me go but uh, one newspaper in London carried an editorial we have a copy of it you can see it if you like in which they were asking people to pray for me because they heard I was sick and it is true that I uh, have uh, a problem that it's been in all the press it was in headlines in some newspapers I have Parkinson's uh, the beginnings of it it's under control by medication and uh, how does it affect me I wrote to our constituency this week who had been writing to us about it and it causes trembling in the hands I can't write letters anymore and the only person that can read my writing is my secretary who's here today my wife's having a hard time with it herself and uh, my secretary can make out some words but I've been writing little notes all my life and it's very difficult to have to give that up and then I uh, can't walk down steps I looked at these steps as I came up this morning I can walk up but I need to hold on to something going down so sometimes I have to reach out and grab the man next to me as we go down steps and sometimes he thinks I'm attacking him or if you're walking along a street and uh, you walk a little bit fast you get faster and faster and when you come to the end of the block you can't stop and you might go right out into traffic and kill yourself and uh, so those are the main symptoms and then another symptom is sermons get longer And so I think that's a good place for me to stop. <laughs> now shall we pray. Our blessed Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the cross. And in the song that we sang, And can it be that He, my Lord, should die for me? And John Wesley's words, are so apropos to all of us today that our Lord Jesus Christ died on that cross for us and shed his blood we cannot comprehend such love we thank you and we praise you and we commit ourselves to thee there may be someone here this morning that God has spoken to in a special way we pray that thou wouldst help them to yield to the point that you spoke to them about for we ask it in Jesus name Amen. As you have already heard, today we're 5,000 feet up in the beautiful mountains of Southern California at the magnificent Bible Conference Center at Forest Home. This great conference center was founded many years ago by the late Henrietta Mears and her associates in Southern California who had a vision to train and challenge young people for the gospel. Forest Home is no ordinary conference center. First, it is certainly one of the most beautiful conference grounds in the world. Its magnificent views, its comfortable buildings, its spacious grounds, its clear mountain air and brilliant sunshine, its opportunities for recreation are unsurpassed anywhere in the country. Its mountain trails provide places for young people to walk and meditate with Bible in hand. Hundreds of young men have answered the call to the ministry at this place. Scores of missionaries are in every part of the world as a result of commitments made on this hallowed ground. Every summer, thousands of young people come to this mountain retreat for physical recreation and spiritual nourishment. I first came to Forest Home exactly 21 years ago. I was just a boy preacher working in the Youth for Christ movement. Somehow, Dr. Mears had heard about me and invited me to give two sermons at Forest Home. Dr. Lewis Evans, then pastor of the First Presbyterian Church of Hollywood, called for me at my hotel and drove me high up in the mountains to Forest Home. This was the first time I'd ever met this great preacher and man of God who was to be one of my closest friends in years to come. 
on that Sunday afternoon 21 years ago, I met Dr. Henrietta Mears for the first time. And from that day on, she became one of my counselors and advisors and had a great influence on my life. From one end of America to the other, there are men in the pulpit today who were converted to Christ or challenged to the ministry under this great Bible teacher who for many years was director of religious education at the First Presbyterian Church of Hollywood. When the board of directors of Forest Home were looking for a successor to Dr. Mears, they chose one of my associate evangelists, Dr. Joe Blinko. After many months of praying and thinking, Joe Blinko decided that God wanted him to invest a part of his life in this magnificent California Bible Conference. Joe Blinko has been with us for 13 years and is today one of the most beloved and best known Bible teaching evangelists in the world. God has mightily used him on every continent. Thousands of people throughout the world sing the praises of Christ today because Joe Blinko passed that way. We as a team regretted to lose him, yet we rejoice over the tremendous new opportunities that God has opened for our beloved co-laborer of so many years. Joe is going to continue to help us in crusades from time to time as his schedule permits, and certainly the hearts of our team will be drawn ever closer to Forest Home because he is here. Today, on this April Sunday, we have met to rededicate this magnificent conference ground to the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We've come to dedicate our friend Joe Blinko to this new ministry that God has called him to. I'm sure that thousands of you who have heard Joe Blinko preach and other thousands of you who have been blessed by the conference center here at Forest Home will join me in saying today, God bless Forest Home and God bless Joe Blinko. One of the things that is stressed to young people here at Forest Home is the necessity of living a disciplined, victorious Christian life. There is also an emphasis here on constant witness for Christ. They teach that Christianity grew chiefly because its adherents were not silent. The early Christians had an inner compulsion to express the great faith and joy they'd found. After they had been beaten and stoned for witnessing for Christ, they said, We cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. They stormed against the evils of their day until the very foundations of decadent Rome began to crumble. Christ never allowed anyone to be a bystander or a spectator. Christianity, if it is anything, is something to which you must respond and commit yourself. The word Christian itself means literally a partisan of Christ. A true Christian never plays it safe. He never sits on the fence. He commits himself. However, thousands of people today want Christianity but they resist the idea of speaking out, of making a choice on moral and spiritual issues. Many Christians try to play it safe and be neutral. We like to discuss and debate, but not to commit. Here at Forest Home and in many other Bible conferences throughout the nation, people are asked to make a commitment about the person of Jesus Christ. Christ spoke of only two roads and two masters. You cannot travel both roads. So many young people avoid the choice as long as they can. However, life has a way of not permitting neutrality. Mr. Nehru tried to be neutral, but there came a day when communist China attacked India and he had to forsake his neutrality. You may try to be neutral in politics, but one day you are confronted with the ballot box and you must make a choice. There comes a time when you must stand up and be counted. To remain silent and neutral in the moral decadence all about us makes us just as guilty as those who engage in evil practices. For silence gives consent. Today, we need desperately to have men and women of courage and discipline, for courage and discipline are contagious. And if the world is to be changed, it must be done not by those who go along with the crowd, but by those like Martin Luther, who were moved by something he felt must not be sacrificed to silence or expediency when he cried out, Here I stand, I can do no other. One of America's greatest needs today is to recapture the hardiness and discipline in our national life. We've become reluctant to follow a course that isn't popular, even when deep in our hearts we know it is right. If the odds are 10 to 1 in our favor, then we will take a stand. But if there's any risk involved, we play it safe. We've talked about moral freedom and intellectual freedom so much that most Americans have thrown off moral restraint. Our living, which is luxurious compared to that of the rest of the world, has acted as a narcotic to lull us into moral complacency. Our goal has become money, pleasure, and security. We do not want controls. 
We do not want authority. In the 17th chapter of Luke, there is a reference to the complete indifference which Sodom and Gomorrah exhibited toward the repeated warnings of impending disaster. The scripture says, Likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Christ himself warned, Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Time after time the scripture warns that an immoral and indifferent generation will face judgment. Even American Christians are in danger of forsaking the disciplines of the Christian life. With other Americans, we sit in front of our television screens absorbed in the greatest entertainment spree in history. In the New Testament, we read that God laid down certain specific suggestions as to how the Christian life is to be lived. He warned us that there would be trials, suffering, and persecution. He never said we would be popular. He never promised a life of ease. He said that we were to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil by living a yielded life filled with the Holy Spirit and a self-disciplined life. Christians today resemble very little those first century Christians. We Christians of the 20th century have become soft. We've become absorbed with the world. Until now it is difficult to tell the difference between the true believer in Christ and a man of the world. The Bible teaches that every Christian is to live a life of self-denial and self-discipline. In the New Testament, there are many verbs used to describe this kind of life. We are told that as Christians, we are to fight, wrestle, run, strive, suffer, endure, resist, agonize. These New Testament verbs denote clearly the strenuous effort and the vigorous action on the part of a Christian. Jesus said, by their fruits ye shall know them. Having been born again, we are to demonstrate our faith in our works. James said, faith without works is dead. The effective Christians throughout all history have been men and women of great personal courage and discipline. First, there must be mental discipline. The Bible says plainly that our mental powers are to be brought under the control of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ, says the scripture. Secondly, there must also be the discipline of the body. Paul, who was a splendid example of a disciplined Christian, said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Since our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit, they must be worthy of Him who indwells us. Thirdly, we must also discipline our emotions and our instincts. The Apostle James had never heard of Freud, but he knew something about human nature and psychology. He asked, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust that war in your members? We are born with a set of powerful impulses and emotions. Anger, greed, ambition, pride, sex, and many others. We are told by psychologists that the evils of primitive man still crouch in all of us. That underneath the thin veneer of civilization is the jungle savage. When Christ comes into the heart, he does not destroy these impulses and leave us as lumps of pious putty. He takes the things within us and diverts them as he did the Apostle Peter and transforms them into powers of majestic holiness and usefulness. These are the things that are taught here at Forest Home in the great conferences that are held every summer. I would to God that every Christian listening to my voice would learn something about self-discipline. We must take seriously the words of our Lord when he said, If a man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Today, I'm calling upon Christians everywhere to come to Jesus Christ in dedication, surrender, and self-discipline. We live in a world of revolution. The world is changing every day. Often it is difficult for us to adjust ourselves to so many new situations that face us every day. This is why we so desperately need the control of Christ and Christian self-discipline. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we pray that many that have been listening to our voice today from this beautiful mountain retreat will come to know Christ as Savior and that many Christians will come to know Him in all of His fullness. He who is able to bring victory to our lives and help us to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil that we face every day. We pray that we will come in dedication to Him and surrender of our total personalities to Christ. For we ask it in His name, Amen.